We are here in Painter's Restaurant in Brookhaven for our drinks with a local, and we have special guest with us, Greg Giannotti. He is going to be taking over the morning slot with Boomer Sizen as a next big thing coming to the fan, right? <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> I hope we're not sitting here a year from now and I'm fired. I hope I'm the next big thing, Nick. But yes, that's what's happening right now. So yeah. I kind of like uh, compare it to sports, right? So we have... The big dog, he's leaving, right? Mike Francesa. Yes, he is. So I would call him something like a, like a Brett Favre. And I would liken you to maybe an Aaron Rodgers. Is that something that we can compare? I hope so. I, I would love to look back on my career and say that I, I was Aaron Rodgers-like. I mean, it's, it's tough to, to say that one guy leaves, another guy comes in. It's, it's a tricky thing because everybody's so different, especially when it comes to, to radio. But when... I was offered this job, one of the management there at CBS Radio, we're now owned by Intercom, but he shook my hand and said, all right, you're now playing center field for the Yankees. So if you want to make an analogy like that, I think that, that's a pretty good one. That gave me goosebumps when he said that to me. All right, awesome. So you are a Bellport guy. We're here in Brookhaven. How far away did you live from this restaurant? Walking distance. I grew up in Brookhaven Hamlet, um, right down the road from here. There was many times where I would have too many of these or something else, and I'd end up walking home, and that was the smart thing to do. And now I live in, in Bellport. So I, I, I wanted to come back and, and be where I grew up. It was very important to me with my family and friends, and I always wanted to work at WFAN. I used to work there behind the scenes, and every move that I made in radio was to get back here, to be doing exactly what I'm doing. So it's sort of been a surreal experience. I mean, I, I would walk in here as a 21-year-old, 22-year-old on Thanksgiving Eve, acting like an idiot, having no idea where my life was going to go. And now I'm a 35-year-old acting like an idiot, having no idea where my life's going to go. But I, uh, I do have a lot of things in that back pocket that I've accomplished, and I'm very, very grateful for that. So were you ever here on a Sunday just rooting for whoever you root for, saying, you know, I think I could do this for a living? Yeah, I, you know, it's funny because I, everybody has like that dream of the thing that they absolutely want to do more than anything else. I mean, I, if you asked anybody, if you could do one thing in your life, what would it be? And, you know, people have outlandish things. Some people have more realistic things. And for me, it was always to, to talk sports for a living, especially at WFAN. I would, I would drive to Mets games and, and listen to the fan driving in, driving back and, and, and loving that and thinking that, Boy, if I could just do that, but I never thought it was really a realistic thing. I thought, that's stupid. Why am I going to try to do that? There's, it's probably easier to get into the NBA than it is to, to be someone who's on the air. There's like five guys. They never leave. Once they get those jobs, they're there forever. So I kind of put it on the, the back burner and tried to do some other things. I was actually going to be a music teacher for a while. I went to school to be a music teacher, realized that that was the worst decision I'd ever made, and then said, you know what? I can't live with myself if I don't give it a shot. And I wanted to give communications a shot, radio a shot. I did change my major from music into sports, or communication rather, uh, with uh, an idea I wanted to do sports talk radio. And it ended up working out. It was uh, remarkable how it did, but through internships and hard work and, and luck and stuff like that, here I am. So you went, you interned at WFAN, right? Yep. And that progressed into a part-time gig with them? It did, yeah. So uh, right, I was hired right out of the internship and got a part-time job. I was a part-timer for just over a year, 13 months. And one of the, the bosses that's still there remembers a conversation I had with them where I was complaining about how long it was taking me to get a, a full-time job. And he said, I remember, it feels like it was just yesterday you were in here bitching to me about wanting a full-time job because you were tired of being a part-timer. And, uh, and look how it worked out. So, uh, so yeah, right out of the internship, part-timer, and then sort of took off from there. So you were a producer, right, for the Joe and Evan show? Yeah, I was, yep. So I started out as a uh, night and weekend producer. I was with Steve Summers at night, and that was the first guy who allowed me to, to go on the air, do different voices, mm -hmm. and have fun. And then that's what got me noticed. And then Joe and Evan hired me when there was a midday show opportunity. And then I was in front of the bosses every day. So I was, I was there, and they saw me every day. I wasn't nights and weekends where they left. And there was, remember specifically, it was one day where I was arguing with Joe Beningo about something in sports. I thought he said something stupid. I had a rough morning. I was just like, you know what? So I just started laying into him about how dumb I thought he was for saying what he said. And I, as I'm doing this, I see out of the corner of my eye, Mark Chernoff, who is the, still the program director there at WFAN, he's looking at me. And he just starts smiling and nodding and smiling. And then he says, I think I'm going to give you a show. 
And I was like, what do you mean, give me a show? Well, he's like, I'm going to put you on an overnight show. See how you do. And I did. It was the day after Thanksgiving 2008. I just opened up, did a monologue on Stefan Marbury. I remember that. <laughs> and, uh, and then walked out in that first break. And I said, you know what? I mean, I, I, can, I can do this. And, uh, and then a few months later, I got the opportunity to go to Pittsburgh and, and took that opportunity to see if I could do it full time. So when you were in Pittsburgh, uh, how welcoming was the crowd there? A New York guy going over to the Steel City. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a provincial town, right? I mean, they, they really are all about Pittsburgh. <laughs> like, that's what they are about. So they don't like the outsiders if you don't respect them. So I knew that. So I went in and said, all right, I, I'm not going to tell them that I know more than them. I'm not going to come in and fit the New Yorker stereotype and be some arrogant jerk who just shows up and say, you guys don't know what you're talking about. I'm from New York. There's no good pizza or bagels out here. Screw you. <laughs> like, you can't do that, right? So you, I went in and I learned as much as I could about the history of it because I wanted to be on the air. And if someone asked me about, you know, the 1974 AFC Championship game, I would be able to talk to them about it. And I just, there was two weeks there that I moved to Pittsburgh before the launch of that station. I just read and learned. I read Dan Rooney's book and I just sort of absorbed it all. So then I came on the air with uh, no chip on my shoulder, no arrogance really, and just was like, all right, here I am, work on the craft. And they, they seemed to like me right away because of that. You know, if, if someone called up and, and felt that they knew more about the Pirates than I did, I, I would let them tell me about it, right? As opposed to being a jerk about it. Um, and that, I think, really ended up helping me out there to, to move up. And I did nights. I moved there for nights. Six months in, they gave me the promotion at a morning show there. So it happened very quickly. So, right, you, you've been, you're in Pittsburgh this whole time. You, you, you're... I'm allowed to drink, right, Nick? All right. <laughs> we'll let you drink here. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you can do that on air, though. Uh, it depends. Now that I have a TV simulcast on CBS Sports Network, in addition to the FAN show, yeah. I can't drink. I was no. gonna. I was gonna ask you about that. What is it like going to be on TV now? I don't know. I, I don't. I like the fact that more people can watch us, and I think CBS Sports Network is tremendous. I think that they do amazing work, and the people that are there are so talented. Uh, I just wish they didn't have to wear makeup every day. They put makeup on you every single day. You got to sit in a chair at five thirty in the morning, get this stuff caked on you. It's not exactly me, but I'll get used to it, and it's a tremendous opportunity to be across the country. So I'm excited about that. All right, so you you're out in uh, Pittsburgh this whole time. Are are you in uh you know are you in talks with you know Beningo, Evans, and Francesca? Are those guys giving you advice on how you can progress your your career? Because you said you always wanted to be back uh, yeah. in New York in the New York market. Yeah, a little bit. I I think that there's certain guys that were good mentors and certain guys that are sort of out of sight, out of mind. Uh, for example, like Joe Beningo is one of my best friends in this business. But unless you're right in front of Beningo's face he'll forget that you exist. Like, he's one of those guys. What are some of the things that Joe, Joe would say to you? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Joe, <laughs> uh, bro, what are you doing here? Aren't you supposed to be in Pittsburgh? What, I don't even, uh, what are you, who are you? I don't know. You give me like six more months, I'll forget you even existed. And let me say something about Joe. Nobody has said nicer things about me than Joe Benengo. It's crazy. I don't know why he does this, uh, but he's so unbelievably nice to me. Even the day of the announcement on FAN, they brought in the new afternoon show, then they brought in me, and then they brought in Joe and Evan after that because they signed new contracts and extended the show an hour. And, uh, and Joe and Evan there were just unbelievable. They just said the nicest stuff about me, and I really thank them for always having my back. So a while back, you were with Francesca, and Joe, Joe Beningo was there. And he said that you were the most talented person in the network. And uh, uh, Francesca said... Wait until he gets a real job. Yeah, we'll find out when he gets a real job. Yeah. So, so now you got a real job. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would hope that some of the other jobs I had too were real jobs, but this is definitely the realest of them all. That's classic Mike, though. I mean, Mike's not going to, especially at that age, that was what, nine years ago now? Like at that age, he's not going to give you any credit unless you really earned it. Um, but that was kind of cool to look back on. It was funny how that video clip resurfaced after I got announced as the morning show host that people went all the way back to that. It is, it's, you know, it's, it's funny when you see something like that, like it feels like an eternity ago and it really isn't that long, you know? I mean, it's a weird age, like mid thirties, like cause so much changes from your mid twenties to your mid thirties. It's just everything, your perspective on life. This is the way I feel your perspective on life. I mean, the, the things that are important to you. I mean, everything seems to change. So when I was looking back on that video, I was like that, that's a totally different person than I am now, but he still wanted the same things, and I, I worked hard enough to be able to get those things. Let's talk about your new, your new partner in crime now, Boomer. What is your chemistry like working with him? 
he is one of the hardest work. He, you know what? Not one of. He is the hardest working guy I've ever been around. So ultimately, there's respect there. And then we got the South Shore Long Island thing too, which is perfect. We'll sit and talk about Joe Sip and Sal Champy and East Islip and Bellport football and all that stuff. So immediately, you know, the the places he likes to hang out out east, I'm not rich enough to be able to go to, but I know where they are. So we have we share that in common. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that right off the bat, because we grew up not that far from each other, that was instant chemistry. And then, you know, the fact that we both played high school football in the same area. Uh, I had a better career than him, though, clearly. You know, I mean, I got into like two games as a, as a varsity player out of pity. And uh, he was Boomer Esiason. So, uh, but yeah, so there was, you know, a uh, instantaneous, you know, just boom, this is going to work. You know, I think because... We had respect for one another right off the bat, which is very, very important. And the fact that our backgrounds <laughs> were somewhat similar. It's funny for me to say that because he played in the NFL and won an MVP. But, the, but you know what it's like when you're from a certain place, no matter where that person's gone, they'll always have that as the default setting. You know, like, where are you from? East Islip. You know, all the stuff that he did. You know, went to Maryland, went to Cincinnati, you know, was a quarterback in the NFL, won an MVP, played in the Super Bowl. He's still a guy from East Islip, right? So I think that's sort of where we started with our chemistry and built from there. So, so you, got, you went from Pittsburgh and you get this big national show for CBS. What is it like having to cover pretty much everything? Well, the good thing about doing a national show is no one expects you to know everything about everything, right? When you do a local show, when I was in Pittsburgh and when I'm going to be doing the fan show, everybody expects you to know everything about every local team because there's only a handful of them and you better know everything that we care about. A national show, they're like, all right, you can't possibly, unless you're a robot computer or some sort of, you know, weirdo, you're going to know everything about everything. So you can pick and choose what you wanted to talk about, what was interesting to you. So that was the good part about it. The bad part about it is that your, your audience, it's not as passionate, right? Because the passionate people are going to go to their local stations, you know, they're with their local hosts that, that sound like them, that care about the same things as them. And like, I could never open up a show and go, I can't believe this knucklehead cut me off on the HOV lane at the exit 33 at the LIE. You know, you can't say that stuff because then some guy in Tuscaloosa is like, what? So I was talking to a guy yesterday about uh, Khalil Mack, and he's out there telling me about his stance, how he penetrates defenses. And then I'm like, what do you do for a living again? He's like, I'm a forklift driver. Right, and, yeah. You know, you know the, the audience that you're talking to now, they're a lot smarter would you, sure. is, that, is that something that resonates to you? Yeah, of course. I mean, it used to be when Sports Talk started that the hosts and people who covered the teams had more information than the consumer. That's not the case anymore. But that's why I think it's very important now as the business progresses to be entertaining. Right? The, the, you don't go to WFA and you don't go to a Sports Talk show nowadays because you need to learn something necessarily. Sometimes you do. Right, but everything's on your phone. You pull your phone out and get whatever stat you want. Everything is tailored to what you like. You get push notifications on your phone. So you're not going there to get that those stats, those information. You're going there to listen to that particular person's take on whatever is going on and to be entertained by that person. I mean, for example, everybody knows, and we're we're filming this today. Ben McAdoo was fired by the New York Giants. Also, Jerry Reese, the general manager. Reese's Pieces. Yeah, everybody, very nice. So everybody knows that right now, right? But when Mike Francesa signs on his show this afternoon, people aren't going there because they don't know what happened or need to know what happened. They're going there because they need to know what Mike thinks about it, right? That's important to them. So, yeah, you have to respect the intelligence of the listener, because you're right, they're, they're more informed than they ever were. But that was never an issue with me. I always assumed that the audience was was extremely intelligent. Now it's about keeping them there, right? Why, why do they want to come back? They want to come back because you made them laugh, because you made them think, you know, stuff like that. And that's the challenge of a talk show host. And what's the most grueling part as a sports radio host? Do you, are you staying up Every night watching every football game, you have everything DVR, Mets, Yankees, everything. How, how does that Well, that's, I, I'm going to find out because I haven't, <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't done that part of it yet. Like, I'll admit there's times of the national show, like, for example, you know, last night, like, I couldn't stay up to watch the end of that game because I knew we weren't going to open with it because we had the college football playoff. And last night as we filmed this was a, a Sunday night game between the Eagles and the Seahawks. 
And I said, you know what? I'll wake up. I'll find out what's going on because it's going to be at some point in the show. It's not going to be the lead. And I'm tired, right? <laughs> but in local radio, like I couldn't do If that were the Jets or the Giants, I got to watch every single snap, right? So that's going to be a little bit of a challenge. And getting up for a morning show, I wake up at 3.15 in the morning. I'm out of the house at 3.45. Using the word grueling, I think, is perfect because that's exactly what it is, you know? And, and it's there's days where you wake up and then you feel like you're underwater the rest of the day to try to you know, get through your day. You try to take a nap. Sometimes it makes you feel worse. First world problems, trust me. It's not a, that big of a deal. Um, but if you want to say the most challenging and most grueling part is that, is staying up, watching the games, then waking up like a zombie to be able to present it in a fun and entertaining way. So you were in Pittsburgh, uh, plenty of winning teams over there. Now you're in New York, plenty of not winning teams yeah. going on over here. What is, what is that transition like? Well, there were some rough years in Pittsburgh, too. you got to remember, when I got to Pittsburgh, the Pirates were a just disgusting mess. Now, that turnaround there was a lot of fun to watch. But, I mean, it's tough. I mean, luckily, the Yankees, I think, are on a nice track right now. I don't think the Mets can have a worse year than they had last year, which will be nice. It is tough to make uninteresting teams interesting. But when there's so much going on, like just think about what's gone on with the Giants. I mean, that's a bad team, right? But all the storylines are coming out of them. What you don't want is apathy. That's the one thing you don't want. You don't want that team that in the NFL is 7-9 and nine and nobody really cares and they don't have a shot. You don't want that baseball team that's like out of it by August. You don't want that. You either want a complete disaster or a team that's winning. And uh, luckily, we've gotten a couple of complete disasters. I mean, you never know what's going to happen. That's the great thing about local sports and sports in general is you try to predict it and think, like, what, you know, how is this going to go? But there's always something new, always a great storyline that's out there to be able to digest. So, you know, you're coming into the fan now. It's going through a lot of overhaul, a lot of different changes. How do you think that, you know, you being here with Boomer now, how could you guys help uh, the station grow going forward? I think it's really important that Boomer's – there because he's familiar you know and there's a lot of change that's going on and boomer staying in the morning and the brand of that i think is is great and i think that our show is going to be very very successful and a morning show sets the tone for the day you know and if that morning show is good and what you know boomer and craig did for so many years for a decade were just spectacular i think we can do that we can keep it there we can we can be number one and then that'll help throughout the day and that's the goal you know and, and there's a new afternoon show now that's going to be all eyes on them because it's the first time that someone not named Mike Francesa or Chris Russo is in that slot in a couple of decades so I think I kind of like the fact that there's more attention on them <laughs> so I can just slide in and do our thing but I, I love the team effort we have there and everybody's rooting for each other I mean, the day that we were announced, we were all together, and we were just so excited just looking at each other. This is the new FAN, and we're, we're ready to uh, make it as great as it ever was. When I call, will you be answering that phone line? No. Come on, man. I'm on the air. <laughs> Too good for that now. What, are you uh, kidding me? Those producer days are over, so I won't answer the phone. If I see your name up there, I'm not taking your call either. No, of course I will. I promise. I, I, that's the number one thing people ask me is, if I call in, are you going to take my call? Of course I will for crying out loud. It's going to be really tough to get through. Give me one toast one last time. It's a greater patch hog. Greaterpatchhog.com, Mike White, and beautiful painters here, by the way, for allowing us to do this. Thank you.